Deep House Sound. Um, and today what we're going to show you is we're going to show you uh, a little bit about the machine, Ableton, and a few other little toys that he likes to use. So uh, without further ado, you guys, give it up for Mike Huckabee. Okay. Well, again, I'm Mike Huckabee from Detroit, and um, <laughs> I'll be showing you a lot about machine, Ableton, Reactor, because in my opinion, that's the holy trinity of software. Other than that, that's all you need. Um, using Reactor quite a bit, been using it for 10 years, still learning tons. It's sharpened my ears uh, tremendously, changed my listening to more like clairvoyant type of listening where I'm approaching production from what is possible instead of from what simply exists. You can all already hear. Um, when I'm listening to music or I'm listening to a remix proposal, I'm listening to the potential of what can take place instead of what is simply there. Um, pretty much step my, my uh, music profile or remix profile up probably in the last five years, I guess. You know, we really are in the golden age of production. Uh, you know, I was watching a, I was watching a tutorial online. Um, God, what's this guy's name? Seventies. He was. He was a. He was doing granular synthesis methods in the seventies, and he was just talking about how, like, in order to achieve something like that, it took like over a week, for like the computers to render a file, which at that point could even uh, be considered unusable after all the processing time. So now we have like tools on laptops and you know we have Ableton and we have Reactor, we have Machine, we have iMachine, we have all these tools and you know this really is the golden age of production. A lot of things are really sim simple right now. Time stretching uh, has come a tremendous way in the last 10 years. You know, you would when you would use samplers to try to achieve or perform time stretching. The results could vary, could be unusable after spending like so many hours of trying to get the sound to to um, uh, be corrected in terms of pitch or, or 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 tempo. And now it's just as easy as using warp markers. So it really is a uh, Good to know where a lot of this stuff comes from. So, um, a little bit just about my background. Like, I've been doing remixes for Juan Atkins, Vadis Law Delay twice, uh, Local Dice remixes. That's his studio, which was an amazing studio, by the way. <laughs> Blew me away. Actually, and those, those guys, like, man, they schooled the hell out of me, man. They with just showing me like all types of stuff and you know and that's one thing like I don't I don't separate I don't come from a school where I separate hardware from software I mean I think I can never see myself not using Reactor I can never see myself not using an actual synthesizer so I think the best approach is a, is a nice marriage between hardware and software I mean you, you probably can't even argue with that Deep Core did remixes, Kaku, Loso, just on and on, and tons of, tons of like remix projects. Just, and I will have to say, you know, that uh, I will have to say that again, you know, Reactor is just kind of like shaped, shaped, shaped and influenced my listening and my production, you know, because. You know, early in the you know early Detroit techno days, you know we started off with synthesizers, and now <laughs> Juno 106s are like $800 on eBay. Like you could always find one of those for like $300 or something. You know these uh, 808s, 909s. You know and the MMT8 that was a classic uh, sequencer in Detroit produce all these records, you know, tons of records on these levels. Then things started to move towards uh, sampling. And, uh, 
you know, S900 to S, the ASR10. That was my favorite uh, sampler right there, the Roland S7. Super warm filters. Amazing. Pay like $3,000 for that sampler like in the mid 90s. Now you can get that sampler for like $300 or something. Probably even less than that. Now I actually would invest. I would invest in a hardware sampler. There are some benefits. Yeah. That's kind of like a SB12 makeshift SB12 or something at that point. Um, then, you know, things started moving towards the uh, hard disk recorder aspect types of thing. Uh, Roland 880. Then we started, you know, after the, after the hardware, the, the uh, workstations and the hard disk recording and then the software boom. In the mid 90s came about with Reason, probably one of the first fully uh, suitable um, software recording programs. You know, just when I saw Reason, I was like, "Whoa!" Um, hadn't made a hadn't made a migration into that yet, but started to look at it. And then here's like what Dynamo or Generator, which was like early, early. Uh, kind of version of, of a reactor at, to some extent and you know you know start he getting heavily in the programs and you know dog wars started to pop up when you, you know had like Pro Tools, Logic, Cubase and then Ableton. It's the sound we want. So uh, that this is this is really interesting because uh, th this this artist is Delia Debashar. And uh, she was doing like some really creative and uh, unique um, experimental 60s. And uh, check out what she was actually it's doing. It's already in real life, say, we can go and record it. The sound I want for the rhythm of this piece uh, needs to be a very short, dry, hollow rhythm sound I can get from this. And then the sound for the punctuating chords. I want the sound of a short, wise, straight string being plucked. And then all we have to do is cut the notes the right length. We can join them together on the loop and listen to them. And then with the higher notes of the rhythm, again we join them together on the loop and play it in synchronization with the first tape. This, we can play the sound of the plaque mm -hmm. string, which can be either in the form of the loop, like this. I mean, that's, you know, in the 60s, you know, that was really revolutionary uh, when she was doing that. You know, it's really important to, like, look, because that's probably, like, the first live, like, analog tape, even live set, if you really even looked at it like that. And if you could fast forward her into the future, into, like, 2012 and show her, like, everything quite very live to see how far, you know, this is coming. Because the one thing about all four of those tape machines is that the more they play each part is going to drift out of sync so now it's you know as simple as like pressing a button to cause uh, synchronization to infinity <laughs> so that is just useful to see where we came from so uh, what are my what are my tools of the trade um, machine on the, on the software side machine Reactor in Ableton, and the one thing I'm saying that that every producer needs is resourceful tools, because you know your your setup needs to be extremely extremely resourceful and easy to get and easy to convey your ideas through the machines. 
uh, with um, as less hassle, I suppose, as possible. Ableton uh, just allows me a, um, a tremendous amount of uh, creativity. I think it's the most creative of the DAWs, actually. I think that Ableton is the most creative application of the DAWs. Uh, machine, machine came out, you know, great sound quality, uh, set up very well. It's just really fun to use and, uh, you know, when you're using it, you don't necessarily even think that you're using a computer. Um, so I have like a lot of samples from all types of drum machines and I've incorporated them into machine like I just, you know, found a sample CD that had like nearly every drum machine uh, and I imported it in the machine so, you know, I'm pretty set for drums. Um, Real quick, sorry, I was just wondering how much do you use or when, like, when you start a project? W what do you like to use first, machine or Ableton? That's, yeah, that's, see, that's a good question because inspiration comes from anywhere. I can start from anywhere. I can, and again, like I made a clip online. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but I played some chords from a dry drum loop. I'm going to actually show you how that's done because you can find a lot of harmonics in places that you never thought about. <laughs> um, and you know, that's something I discovered through Reactor, and, and Reactor's helping me to come up with new uh, methods of synthesis that don't necessarily exist. Mm -hmm. I'm creating my own methods of, methods of synthesis. So, what do I start from? I can start from anything. I can start from a drum kick. Cool. I can start from a melody, a tone. I mean, you know, I can literally start from anywhere, but again, I think the key to production is resourcefulness, and you need to evaluate the tools you use, and and evaluate are they resourceful to you? Do they help you solve problems? Because a lot of people think that when you're making music on a computer, that it's it's just it, all your problems are solved. Actually, it's that's untrue. Yeah, the, the computer introduces a lot more problems for you that you as the user have to figure out a way to navigate through them to convey your ideas. You have to go through the hierarchy of how the uh, software is set up in order for you to maximize or benefit from a workflow that is mm -hmm. of value to you. Yeah. So a lot of people think that like I got it made when I'm, I'm using the computer. I think that will uh, lead you into a um, a dead end path actually. So again, I could start from anything. A um, couple of things I like about Ableton is, first of all, like you, you can be in a, you can be in a, a, a 120 house session and still play a loop, a hip hop loop without even loading up a hip hop uh, project. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to do that. So like here I am, Let's see what we got here. So let me low like a, this is low like a kick or something. Uh, drums. So here I am. So here I am with, uh, I'm, uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, let's see. So here we are with, Here we are. Here we are in the one one twenty. Here we are in the one twenty. Here we are in the one twenty uh, house session. So here, if I want to switch my train of thought to something uh, hip hop related. All I have to do is go here to the master and edit uh, the launch tempo. Uh, this loop is what? What is this loop? It should be like um, 86 beats per minute. So edit launch tempo 86. So now 
and then let's say here, uh, let's say I want like this to be 120 edit launch tempo. Edit launch tempo, 120 BPM. So now when we play this, oops, see it's at 86 beats per minute. Now here, 20. Was really happy when I figured that one out because I would like stop and load in another project at a different tempo. Mm -hmm. So you can just continue to work. You know, and that's really important that you know you could just continue to work without even changing uh, the tempo of your projects. Um, I like to use live as a wave editor. Like I think that you know I haven't used a lot I haven't used a wave editor in a long time. Um, you know, Ableton is helping me, is actually solving and creating a lot of opportunities at the same time. So uh, I was overseas and um, I was checking my email and I got a request to do a radio show in Budapest. And uh, they were right down to the line, to the like, we, we need this today. And so I was mixing off decks because I recorded on a channel in Ableton and one of the records skipped and it was getting close because we had to upload the link and all and uh, so I started over and then so the record skipped again and, and, I, th and I just I realized I said you know what all you have to do is just continue the mix keep just keep running and just go back and edit mm -hmm. edit it out like there is necessarily no need for like um there's nearly no need for. So there's this track. Um, Do you find when you're working that you like to switch between genres like that? Or uh, no, actually yeah. no. But since I can, yeah, I find that as a luxury now. Yeah. Now and then here's another one of my favorites. So like right now, if we, if I hit the uh, tap, if I hit the space bar, we go back to the beginning. But if I hit the shift bar, I, I keep continuously scrolling. Like, simple stuff. So there's a skip here somewhere. There we go. That was the moment of chaos right there. So uh, command uh, four to turn the grid off. Turn it back on or off. So right here. So I just set a loop right there. Command L. So it should be like right here. something like that always want to make sure you get a super tight uh, beginning and end of the loop and that was something that set me back tremendously uh, early on because a lot of my loops weren't cut mm -hmm. so tight because I had never thought about zooming in on the loop would kind of like preview my loops at full view and take it for granted that the loop was cut by, by what I heard by ear. But when I cloak, when I examine uh, my editing or truncating, I was able to reveal that I had, you know, small milliseconds of dead time at the end of the loop. And as time goes on in the track, if you were using analog sequences or if you were printing that audio track would jump or, mm -hmm. or skip and I would actually like have mastering guys pointing out they're like you know some what's going on yeah. with your track yeah. like it's jumping or skipping it's not really noticeable but mm -hmm. they're like I, I, I couldn't understand that for like almost 10 years like you know what was going on with my tracks so here uh, uh, just uh, delete delete time <laughs> 
simple. You know, go back on it, whatever, make it tighter, whatever. So you know, you know, I'm not necessarily using a, a wave editor, but wave editor anymore, because I can perform so many different functions on it on the track. I can raise or raise the uh, tracks volume. I could transpose it. I can reverse it. I can do mm -hmm. nearly everything. Um, and if I want to do anything more, I can use isotope, mm -hmm. which a lot of guys have a lot of questions about um, mastering and applications. Mm -hmm. and so, do you still find even with tools like that digitally, when it comes to DJing, do you do you like to use this stuff, or are you still just Pure vinyl. No, I'm, I'm pure vinyl. I mean, my history is I worked in a record store 14 years, so mm -hmm. you can't take that out of me. I'm, <laughs> I mean, you just, I mean, you just can't take that out of me. Now, for those that choose digital DJing, I mean, I guess that's appropriate for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It uh, has a lot of advantages. Mm -hmm. it has a lot of advantages. Yeah. Um, weightless. Um, you know, you could have an entire Billion songs, yeah, yeah. <laughs> five thousand, yeah, yeah. Library mm -hmm. at your disposal, yeah. You know, not necessarily meaning to knock it. It's just one of those things where you have to determine or decide what works best mm -hmm. for you. So that's cool. where I'm coming from. Cool. Uh, so uh, yeah, so you know, basically using loops. In different sessions, wave editors. Now, um, you know, machine, and we'll we'll get into we'll get into um, we'll get into heavily how this uh, clip, and I'll play this right now. How this sample here in the beginning. Uh, provided me with the chords that we're playing. So this sample here, then I found these harmonics in that, strictly out of that loop. So it's kind of like turning over like new methods, so I'm pre precedent in methods of, of <laughs> synthesis, which, you know, on the granular level is, you know, a lot of harmonics, and uh, I, I actually have, I have another track deep. Uh, there's another track from another loop. Uh, uh, so th the, s the original sample is this. So original sample is this dry drum loop. That was turned into this. Uh, so. so, like you would never look, you would never look there. <laughs> you would never look there. So, those of you that have reactor, get busy. <laughs> I did that in Reactor from that dry drum loop. Oh, you no, nah, we'll 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 yeah, we'll, sorry, sorry. we'll, we'll <laughs> yeah. definitely. Cause I, you know, that when I posted that, like over, it got like more than 500 hits in one day. Guys were like, "Wow, man! Like, how 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 is that possible?" So you know, just when you think that everything under the sun has been found or discovered, it has not. It has not. A lot of people think that you know you. You've run out of ideas, or you know how how much more can you know companies offer on with in features and software? Mm -hmm. It's quite a bit. It's quite a bit left. 
to explore. So um, let's take a look. Uh, we'll take a look at machine and chopping samples and just, you know, I can't say it enough that when I got a hold of machine, it was like a game changer for me. It was like, whoa. Especially when you load in your own samples and you just do so much. You can actually even, because I always look, I always try to go beyond uh, what's available in, in every program. Mm -hmm. I try to like go well beyond the limits of, of how each program is described to me in terms of using it. Um, it's possible to create your own synthesizer and machine. You know, no one is that. No one has necessarily ever uh, explored that. Um, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people get uh, really interested in like how to create dubstep bass lines on machine. A lot of people, you know, and when you when you see so many different. Um, or are using so many different uh, methods of synthesis, this stuff becomes like second nature to you. Mm -hmm. You know, you start climbing higher and higher and higher, and you start getting to places you always were struggling to 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 be in, to begin with, and then boom, it just opens up. And you're like, oh, <laughs> you're like no, nah, that's what's the deal. And then you can just start doing things easier and easier. So mm -hmm. anybody that's using reactor, uh, reactor and, and reactor and machine is, is man, you, you always just have tons of ideas. So how many people work on music and every day, you know, you can't find a source of inspiration or working on a track and nothing's coming about or you're just not feeling anything and you can't come up with another part for that track or a particular sound for that track. How many people have that problem? I mean, let's face it, that, that's a part of the creative process. But if you, through organization and your workflow, you should really not have that problem again. Um, honestly, I can say that like, there is no such thing as a lack of ideas. Mm -hmm. There's like too many ideas now. There's just like too many to choose from at one time is the problem now than saying that there is not uh, an abundance of ideas to uh, choose from or develop mm -hmm. or to develop. Uh, so like here, uh, so when we go to instruments and waveform, so when I load, that in the C group. Okay. So it's just just a couple of clicks away. And you know that you know that's one thing that taught me that like a lot a lot of genres and synthesis methods are just a few tweaks away from 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 the original source of a lot of things and you know London is really good for coming up with different genres and techniques of uh, sampling and just styles of music mm -hmm. and you know the whole dubstep came up which is just kind of like frequency modulation mm -hmm. on a filter and frequency modulation is kind of like really all it is and mm -hmm. so here's a basic square wave so what you want to do is just Tune it. LFO. Uh, you, you, we tune it. We turn the filter on. Okay. Turn the filter. And that. <laughs> For that type of style. I mean, Dubstep is described as so many different, uh, in so many different shades, but mm -hmm. that style of dump of drum and bass. So we need to figure out a way to do that without sitting here all day and 
going up. So I love four. Now, the speed of the LFO, turn it up, apply it to, there it is, a couple of tweaks. And that tells me that somewhere, that tells me that, at least that's what I hear, is that somewhere in any program, whether it's in Ableton or whether it's in Machine or Reactor, that a genre is sitting there waiting to happen by just a few tweaks. And you really can describe it as that. And when we speed up the LFO, uh, now uh, one thing I do like in machine is using the maximizer. Maximizer can help you beef up sound. Much louder. Always use a maximizer on your drums or parts. So here we have it off. Here we have it on. Look at that. Beef it up crazy. So we go back. We go back to the sampler. this in we put this in a uh, pad mode now you can put come up with a melody right there it's whatever way you want so get out of that um, now what now what another really useful um, parameter when you're creating this is the LFO depth. So let's take a look at what takes place when you adjust the LFO depth. Kind of smooths that out so you can hear even more of the LFO cycle. Sound like I'm using a filter though, doesn't it? You would, you know, in a lot of instances you would describe that as a filter being used. LFO depth. Really, really useful to know that. Um, another parameter um, here is the syncing. Very important when you're trying because not. So if we went back in the pattern mode. No, I didn't mean. So we went back in the uh, pad mode and tried to play this. Now we try to play this up under some hip hop drums. The LFO is doing its own thing in nature. It's not synced. You would need to sync that. Um, you know, it took it took you know it took me like years. So let's just load in some some hip hop drums. So let's see here. Uh, there's hip hop. Let's see here. Vinyl Attic drums. I like this kit. This guy's got some dope drums. So, uh, here. I think you touched on this before, but are you using a lot of machines loaded in samples, or do you like to like, like, sample from I like, records? I like or? To, yeah, I like to bring in uh, sample collections. I like to use machines. Mm -hmm. I like to, you know, I kind of ha have gone through the entire library. <laughs> nice. You know, the machine comes with 14,000 sounds, so yeah. you really do want to invest in, like, going through it to see what, what it has to offer you. Mm -hmm. Something like that. 
load. Garage here and just load. Something like that, right? Now, uh, about 80, 90 beats per minute. Okay. Be a little faster than that, actually, but for this. Put the hair to like 116 because that pattern would be too rigid if it wasn't set to that. Speed it up. about 98 beats per minute see like I don't even do hip-hop and but I love hip-hop so like you can you know wherever your interests are you can you can just go there you don't have to like oh uh, I never was hanging out at hip-hop clubs I never was uh, this guy with this grimy collection go where your heart goes go go you don't you know just you don't have to be all of that now so now now let's try this. See it's, it's not sync. And depending on the uh, speed of the LFO, which um, I'm going to actually... basic square wave. That's, that's just out of a fundamental square wave. See, without the sink, House minded. Right. How would you typically like to start? Like, let's say you're going to sit down and use the machine and you either have an idea or you're going to mess around. How, I mean, do you have any certain right, right. Like, yep. way I'm to start? Or? Yeah, I'm about to pull that, oh, my, cool. that template up. Cool. Because if you literally organize yourself with machine, uh, you should just have tons. You can, you can have tons of tracks a matter of no time. So I have a session called 64 Drum Tracks. 
Now, here we go. So when I get a, so what I do is I try, in this session, when I have several sessions like this, like I'll take a, a collection of uh, drum sounds from a t particular drum machine and I'll try to just exhaust the amount of patterns that I could create and machine based off of that drum machine. Uh, I try to just break it. Mm -hmm. I try to learn as much about it. Uh, so here, actually, like my and it's drum picks. So like I have a, I have all these drum machines, and I didn't just sit there and just you know use them without investigating or learning about them. I wanted to learn as much as I could. I mean, just so I have all these drum machines, it's crazy. Just drum machines I haven't even heard of, like Echo Computer, which is pretty cool. So do you devote a lot of time to not only working on tracks, but just having sessions where you're just experimenting the whole time? Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely, okay. definitely, definitely. And and even being surprised along the way. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you you just kind of let happen, or like tonight I'm just going to experiment with stuff? Do you like sit down with that plan in mind, or is it more? Yeah, of and then sometimes it's just when you're working on some uh, when you're working on some dedicated, some just jumps out at mm -hmm. you that's just unrelated. Mm -hmm. Like literally tackle that. And even stop what you're doing and try to develop that because that moment will be lost. Mm -hmm. So, like, when you come across something that doesn't fit in the project, like, what is really interesting, like, go with that. Mm -hmm. Stop what you're doing and go with that and say the project up under a different name or something. So, again, like, I have that collection of drum sounds. And, mm -hmm. you know, some of those samples are a bit low. Mm -hmm. So I put the maximize on it, mm -hmm. beef up the signal. Mm -hmm. um, record out to analog gear, you know, mm -hmm. when needed, which, you know, is quite mm -hmm. uh, a lot, actually, yeah. just to, you know, get a fat, warm sound. Yeah. And then other than, like, the analog gear or the maximizer, do you do any sort of, like, mixing along the way, like any sort of EQing on your, like, stock drum not, sounds? No, not, 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 in the com not in the computer realm. No. I'll leave that to the outside domain. Okay. Where I'm using analog compressors, uh, analog EQs, mm -hmm. those type of things okay. on the actual desk, the uh, signal path on the desk. Cool. And that type of thing. Cool. Can we hear some of the drum loops that you have in the machine? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, the I, machine, that's the okay machine, with you guys. Right? Yeah. Okay, so here, um, here's, so here's my session where I start some house. Cool. So, uh, you know, because machine is not a DAW. I don't know who, where this rumor came from that People think that machine is a dog. I mean, you got guys like, oh man, I can get rid of Ableton now. I can get rid of, I can get rid of my dog now. It's not a dog. I don't know where this this came from. It's not endorsed as a dog by Native Instruments. It you need a dog more than anything when you're using machine. It's not a dog. Um, a lot of people see a, a lot of functionality as a dog, mm -hmm. but it's not it's not a dog. Um, and if you you know, you sit back and you use a machine where like you're just working on one track at a time. Every time you start a machine session, it's going to take you a long time. So what I try to do in every scene, every scene is a, a, is a different drum track. Okay, so I need to turn that tempo up 120. So each scene is a different drum track. So here, right there, always using that, just a standard 404 kick. So I'm playing around parts on different synthesizers, different VSTs, hardware, whatever. And I try to make it 64 of the most common drum tracks that I could possibly hear or use myself. And I'm mm -hmm. always improving this template. I'm mm -hmm. always improving this template. So I move on. Always, you always hear that. Mm -hmm. You know, you always hear that. Now, another thing about scene is that is the scene uh, uh, resolution and settings right here. So here, when they're set to like one, so 
Now that scene fires off, has to wait. But I like my scenes to fire off as soon as I trigger them. So mm -hmm. I turn the scene uh, resolution here to off. Now, when I select any scene, as soon as I fire it off, it's just gonna go into that next scene. You can come up with it. You can, mm -hmm. you can come up with grooves just like that. And I could sample that. And I could sample myself doing that to a, a, a pad in machine. Mm -hmm. I could sample myself doing that. So uh Let's go in like the H group and clear off like pad 16. I'll just reset that. So, so we we are going to sample me doing this. So you have to do is go in the sample and you have to go into the record functions and set this to internal See, there, there's a signal right there so now here I can select this to uh, record any bar loop of my choice, mm -hmm. or I could just set it to just record and stop when I manually stop it. So let's say I want a two bar loop of that. Now the cool thing about doing that is that doesn't even matter when or where machine is started, it's just going to pick up that, um, pick up and start recording at the beginning of the next bar no matter where it is. So. Uh, so now when we, uh, okay, what's going on? Two bar loop. Okay, I got to start it from. So now, so when I hit start, it's going to start. I wasn't in scene mode, but. Probably now it probably even probably even see it even it even recorded that. Mm -hmm. It even recorded that. But I wasn't in C 